Hello, this is Alan, welcoming you to the 2086 edition of the Enfield Talking Newspaper. Dates line 23rd of February 2017. The readers this week are Sonia, Jenny, Roz and myself, with Ian on the controls. The production and distribution team is Keith, Philip, Joan and Jean. Our title music is Country Rock Polka, as I'm sure you know by now. It's composed by Pat Prie, Fernand Bouillon, Harry Breuer, and is performed by Jean-Jacques Perry, and is used with his kind permission. The local news stories that we will be reading come from our local newspapers, the Enfield Gazette and Advertiser, and the Enfield Independent, and are their copyright. The event's information has been collated by us from other sources. The local news headlines this week include Safe Haven, Spaced Out Moggy Jeff Was Diabetic, Brexit Would Spell Disaster for Enfield, and Hundreds Turn Out to Help Save Ruby's Life at Donor Drive. The sunrise and sunset times for tomorrow are sunrise will be at 0658 and sunset will be at 529 in the afternoon. Do get in touch with us to share your own news and any special announcements. We love to hear from you. If you have any comments about the Enfield Talking newspaper, please phone Diane de Jersey on 020-8805-6578. She is, of course, your listener's representative and will be pleased to help you. Now, Sonia will read the first item of local news. Safe Haven. Borough could be one of first to welcome Syrian refugee family. Enfield is set to become one of the first places in the UK to take in a Syrian family under the government's Community Refugee Sponsorship Scheme. In the six months since the Home Secretary and the Archbishop of Canterbury unveiled the scheme to resettle refugees fleeing atrocities in their own country, only a couple of organisations have got the go-ahead. Rigorous assessment, a long list of requirements and a figure of £4,500 raised per refugee mean that is a tough process. But the Enfield Refugee Welcome Group has submitted an application to the Home Office which, if approved, could see a Syrian refugee family welcomed to the borough in as little as two months' time. Group spokesman Peter Livermore said, It's an onerous task and a very big responsibility, but rightly so. It's taken the best part of a year to get everything in place. We can blame the government and say it's up to them to do more for refugees, but as individuals, we have all got skills and compassion to help desperate people who need our help. Before an application can even be considered by the government, an organisation must have a private landlord in place to take the family, school support, a GP lined up and the help of churches and mosques, everything needed to provide refugees with the support they need to integrate successfully into the community. The Enfield Refugee Welcome Group is made up of scores of volunteers from every walk of life. It also has the backing of various churches in Enfield and Palmer's Green Mosque in Oakthorpe Road. To reach a target of £9,000, The group has held a series of fundraising events including carol services, coffee mornings, music gigs and church collections and it has a Just Giving page. Mr Livermore is in charge of coordinating the Befrienders, people who will support refugees with everything from applying for travel passes to shopping to helping them find their feet when they first arrive in the UK. He said, we are hoping that this is just the start and that once we've been approved, we can apply to take more families. 
The Community of Refugees Sponsorship Scheme was meant to supplement the work of the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme, under which the government pledged to resettle 20,000 Syrian refugees by 2020. Prime Minister Theresa May has come under continued pressure to reopen the UK scheme to accept lone child refugees, as the Labour peer Lord Dubbs delivered a petition condemning its sudden closure to Downing Street on Saturday. About 50,000 people have signed the petition amid widespread anger and dismay at a decision to cap the number of children being brought to Britain at 350. It was widely assumed that up to 3,000 children might be helped. Spaced out Moggy, Jeff, was diabetic. A diabetic cat has been reunited with his owner after being found looking a bit spaced out by some rubbish bins. Concerned neighbours at a block of flats in Palmer's Green, Enfield, called the RSPCA after finding the long-haired ginger moggy called Jeff. The 12-year-old cat had been missing for a week and had gone without his medication. Although Jeff had a microchip, it had a digit wrong and he was only reunited with his owner after RSPCA animal welfare officer Susan Naish tracked him down through Lost Cat poster. Mrs Naish said... The callers said they were concerned because Jeff was just sat by the bins in a lethargic statue mode, just staring into space. He had been like that several days, they said. Poor thing. I'm not surprised he was acting a bit spacey. These symptoms are not uncommon for a cat with diabetes who has not had their medication for a week. Owner Aaron Cazzola of Lodge Drive, Enfield, said he was incredibly relieved when he was contacted by Ms Naish with the news that Jeff had been found. He said, We kept looking for him and looking for him, but had almost given up hope. It was awful not knowing what had happened or where he was. Jeff would have died if he'd not been rescued when he was. Thankfully, he's on the road to recovery now, Amazing news for him and us. Miss Naish added, This goes to show how important it is to check the details on your cat's microchip thoroughly and also how lost posters do work. To find out how the RSPCA rescues animals or how you can donate, visit www.rspca.org.uk forward slash give. Brexit would sell disaster for Enfield. Campaigners lobbying for support to stay in Europe were in Enfield on Saturday. Members of Enfield for Europe, EFE, were in Enfield town handing out hundreds of dark Brexit leaflets warning of the perils of leaving the EU. They claim that millions of pounds worth of funding for vital infrastructure projects, schools and homes could be lost if Britain leaves the European Union. They also say that loan funding that Enfield Council has secured at favourable rates from the European Investment Bank, the EU's bank, may be at risk if the government presses ahead with its plan to cut all existing links with the world's biggest trading group of 500 million people. EFE also claims that the funding available for major urban regeneration projects, such as the Council's Meridian Water Development Project in Edmonton, as well as schools and social home schemes, could be in jeopardy. Philip Waller, spokesman for EFE, a group which meets every month in Enfield, said Theresa May is diving headlong into a pursuit of the hardest Brexit possible after a flawed advisory, non-binding referendum that resulted in only a narrow vote to leave the EU. She and her hardline, dogmatic-driven government are betraying the majority of people in Enfield who voted Remain. Most London boroughs voted to remain in the EU during the referendum held in June last year, including Enfield, where 55% of residents voted to stay. But nationally, it was the Leave campaigners who were victorious. Mr Waller said, triggering Article 50 and leaving the EU will be a disaster for Enfield and the wider UK. It will mean Enfield and other local councils 
are unlikely to be able to get relatively cheap long-term funding for vital regeneration, school and housing projects, potentially hitting hundreds or thousands of local jobs. Funding from publicly owned banks like EIB is important because rates are far lower than from commercial banks. EFE believes that if the UK ceases to be a member of the EU and its core institutions, such as the Single Market and Customs Union, future EIB investment in the UK is extremely unlikely. Hundreds of people have signed up to become bone marrow donors after a mother of two issued an urgent appeal. Ruby Cruz, a social worker for Enfield Council, was diagnosed with a rare form of blood cancer late last year. But because the 37-year-old, who is originally from El Salvador, is in the, an ethnic minority, it reduces her chances of finding a suitable donor in the UK. The social worker at Enfield Council set up the Register for Ruby campaign and has organised events to encourage people to sign up to become donors. Elspeth Fuller, who is a colleague of Ms Cruz, helped organise the events in Enfield, Vauxhall and Canning Town last weekend. Ms Fuller said, It is obviously very sad that she is missing moments with her children. It kind of breaks your heart. Ruby and I are friends as well as colleagues, and it seems so unfair for her to be ill. She looks after herself better than I do, so there's a sense of injustice. Miss Fuller said, when the two mothers scheduled a play date last summer, Miss Cruz cancelled, saying she had to go to the doctor about a lump on her neck. After being sent for a scan, doctors diagnosed Miss Cruz with acute lymph- lymphoblastic leukemia lymphoma. She began chemotherapy last November, which she has responded well to, but her best chance of beating the disease is to find a donor. Mrs. Cruz said, chemo has killed most of the cancer, but the doctors say there is a high chance of it returning. So my best chance of curing is to find a donor. Over 200 people signed up so far. The next event will be held at Draper's Hall in Hampton Street, Elephant and Castle at 2pm on Saturday, February the 25th. A rare and historic postbox has been saved from being scrapped. The box in Bramley Road, Cockfosters, which was made during Edward VIII's short reign in 1936, was rusting away and in need of urgent repairs. Its poor condition was noticed by a resident who informed Cockfosters ward councillor Jason Sharalambus. With only two examples of that particular post box remaining in the borough, Mr Sharalambus was keen to notify Royal Mail as well as Enfield Council's heritage officer. The post boxes have particular historic significance because Edward VIII abdicated the throne to marry divorced American socialite Wallace Simpson and became one of the shortest reigning monarchs in British history. In response to a tweet from Mr Sharalambus, Royal Mail reassured him the post box would be restored within the next financial year. Christine White, Enfield's Heritage Project Manager, was pleased to be notified and told him she would look into restoring the post box with a view to adding it to the local list in the next review. Mr Sharalambus said... The message here is that people should definitely step forward if they see something of historical value neglected. Edward VIII was a regular visitor to nearby Trent Park before he became king. And that is where Mr Sharalumbus has (coughs) campaigned for a mansion to house a museum dedicated to World War II heroes. Royal Mail 
together with Historic England, is responsible for the retention and conservation of the 115,300 postboxes throughout the UK. We repaint all our postboxes on a rolling cycle and repair and refurbish those that sustain damage, said Royal Mail spokesman Sally Hopkins. We will be repainting all boxes in the N14 postcode area within the next financial year, she added. This, included, this includes the two Edward VIII boxes in this area. There are about 170 known surviving King Edward VIII postboxes, although not all are in service or owned by the Royal Mail. To report postboxes in need of repair, residents can email postbox.appearance at royalmail.com. A man has absconded from a mental health unit. Mark Peacock, 41, was last seen on Thursday, February the 16th, shortly before 2pm, at Sainsbury's in Green Lanes, Haringey. He had been on a period of escorted leave. He is originally from Essex and is known to frequent various locations in London and the south of England. Mr Peacock has a number of distinctive tattoos, including one which says Made in London on the back of his neck. He also has several swallow bird tattoos on his hands and a British bulldog tattoo on his right leg. He is white, 5 feet 9 inches tall, slim and with close-cropped light brown blonde hair. At the time of his disappearance he was wearing a dark grey polo top, a light grey tracksuit top, zipped grey jacket and black Nike trousers. People are advised not to approach him but to call 999 with any information on his whereabouts. One of the Enfield ringleaders of the infamous Hatton Garden jewellery heist had admitted a one million gems raid on an exclusive Mayfair jewellers five years ago. Daniel Jones, 59, is currently serving seven years for his part in the audacious 25 million burglary of a safe deposit vault in London's Diamond District over the Easter Bank holiday weekend in 2015. He pleaded guilty at Southwark Crown Court to attempting to break into a safe at a jeweller's in Bond Street on the August Bank holiday weekend of 2010. Two other men charged in connection with the Mayfair raid had pleaded not guilty. Another Enfield man, Terry Perkins, aged 68, denies burglary and Charles Matthews from Surrey denies handing stolen goods. They are due to stand trial later this month when Jones from Bush Hill Park will be sentenced. Three quarters of Metropolitan Police officers believe they should all be issued with tasers. The figures are the results of a survey carried out by the Metropolitan Police Federation on nearly 11,000 officers, which showed 43.6% want more specialist firearms officers and 26% believe all police officers should be routinely armed. Just 12% surveyed said they would not carry a gun, and 8.2% said they would resign if asked to carry a gun. Only 6% also think there is an adequate amount of gun-carrying officers in London, and nearly half want more firearms specialists. Ken Marsh, chairman of the Metropolitan Police Federation, said it is more important than ever that officers have the right equipment to keep themselves and the public safe. Two robbers who held up security vans with sawn-off shotguns in a string of raids across the country have been jailed. Nicholas Wordsworth, 43, of Enfield, and Mustafa Murtaitza, 48, from Ince Islington, were sentenced to life imprisonment following a trial at Kingston Crown Court. Police stopped at the pair last November as they drove a Honda Accord with false registration plates. The car contained an arsenal of weapons, including a loaded, sawn-off shotgun, 
a gas-powered revolver, several rounds of ammunition, a stun gun, a bulletproof vest, large hunting knife, masks and a full can of petrol. The court heard how the robbers held up seven armed cash-in-transit robberies across London, Essex, Kent, Sussex, Hertfordshire and Oxfordshire. They disguised themselves by wearing dark clothing and face coverings and set the getaway vehicle on fire after each incident. The men were arrested in Bedfordshire after an investigation by the Met's flying squad with support from other police forces last November. Wordsworth was ordered to serve a minimum term of seven years and nine months, while Mutetsa was ordered to serve a minimum term of seven years and five months. Detective Inspector Mark Bedford said, These were well-planned, violent armed robberies, during which both Wordsworth and Mutetsa terrorised security guards as well as members of the public. Kate Osamore, MP for Edmonton, is calling on the government to do more to boost job prospects for her constituents. The government announced record levels of employment last week. However, the employment level, the unemployment level, in Edmonton remains nearly twice the UK average – with almost 4% of the economically active population in Edmonton signing on. Ms Osamore said, Following the announcement of the employment levels, the government's feeling of triumphalism and optimism is yet to reach Edmonton. The level of unemployment in my constituency is well above the UK average, and the government can and must do more to support the people of Edmonton trying to secure employment. She said she was concerned after reading a report by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation which highlighted the number of families living below the minimum income standard, otherwise known as MIS. MIS is a benchmark of income adequacy, as defined by what the public think is needed for a decent living standard. Ms Osmore, who is the Shadow Secretary of State for International Development, added, As the JRF report highlights... The high cost of living has already helped push 4 million more people below an adequate income. And if the cost of essentials such as food, energy and housing rise further, the government needs to take action to ease the strain. Workers and their families, particularly those in London, are struggling to make ends meet as household costs have been rising while incomes have stagnated. Nature explorers made the most of the great outdoors at Forty Horse Farm Woodland Family Fun Day on Saturday. The focus was on raising youngsters' self-awareness and esteem, with groups taking part in interactive nature activities to boost their creative skills. Youngsters had an excuse to get messy as they made tree boggles, moulding mud faces onto the tree bark, and making mud pies with buckets and spades. Risk management was demonstrated by swinging on ropes and climbing trees with guidance from adults. Youngsters were also given a taste of camping by building dens made out of sticks. Their hard work was rewarded by roasting marshmallows over the campfire. It was a great day, said Melissa Littlestone, founder of Twiggles Explorers Forest School and Outdoor Play, who organised the day at the farm in Forty Hill, Enfield. Even the adults were enthusiastic and got involved in the activities, making mud faces on trees with their children, she added. It was fantastic. A couple carried out a £67,000 VAT scam at the American-themed diner in Upper Edmonton they ran, spending the proceeds on luxury gifts for their family, including Premier League football tickets for Tottenham Hotspur. Andreas Odysseus, 47, and Kathleen Bowman, 48, who ran the Americano Cafe in Western Road, received jail sentences at Blackfriars Court. The duo, from Hornsey, has swindled the inland revenue by submitting falsified claims for VAT refunds on non-existent kitchen equipment they pretended to have bought for the business. 
they produced dozens of fake invoices to support 11 fraudulent claims between May 2012 and August 2014, even when the cafe had ceased trading. The couple continued to fraudulently claim the rebate. The court was told that the theft of £67,000, £768.69 pence refund their lifestyle expenses providing gifts for their family, including Spurs tickets. Odysseus, who found gil- was found guilty at his trial last month, was jailed for two years and two months, and Bowman, who admitted faking documents, was given a 20-month prison sentence, suspended for two years. Speaking after their sentences, Anthony Smallbrick, assistant director of HMRC's fraud investigation service, said, Odysseus and Bowman thought they were above the law and that they could get away with cheating the system, but they were wrong and they were paying the price for their greed. Those who avoid paying their taxes steal from the public services and create an uneven playing field for honest competitors. I urge anyone with information on tax fraud to contact the customs hotline on 0800 595 0 and report it, he added. A murder investigation has been launched after a 23-year-old man was stabbed. Police say the victim had driven a silver convertible BMW to Ivat Way in Tottenham, where he was attacked at 2.20pm on Wednesday, February 15th. He is then believed to have been chased from the car to Downs, Down Hills Park Road. Paramedics treated him at the scene, but he died at 3.15pm. Caring students at an Enfield school have collected enough food to feed more than 600 families who are on the breadline. (coughs) Heron Hall Academy pupils gathered hundreds of tins, packets of rice and noodles, boxes of tea and jars of coffee, as well as breakfast cereals, sauces and biscuits to give to people in need. In total, their donation weighed in at more than a quarter of a tonne, the equivalent of a baby elephant. And divided up, it will provide meals for 620 families. Members of the school council at the secondary school in Queensway, Ponders End, organised the collection. The youngsters also arranged for transport to take the food to a storage facility in Lumina Way, Enfield. Head teacher Matt Collins said, Our students have shown tremendous community spirit. They wanted to demonstrate that everyone can make a difference. I'm very proud of them. Christina Morgan, manager at the storage centre, thanked the students and then gave them a tour of the food bank, showing how the donated items are stored and then bagged up for collection by clients. The costly clean-up of a mountain of rubbish fly-tipped by travellers in an Enfield park began last week. It followed the eviction of travellers from two sites in the borough where they were camped illegally. A convoy of caravans had been encamped on land close to Albany Park in Bell Lane, Enfield Highway, and travellers had also unlawfully occupied land at Brimsdown Sports Ground in Goldsdown Road. Police, Enfield Council officers and bailiffs carried out a peaceful eviction of the travellers last Thursday and Friday. Sergeant Tom Stagg, Enfield Police's traveller liaison officer, said that large quantities of waste had been fly-tipped at the back of Albany Park. This particular group of travellers have fly-tipped in Enfield on previous occasions and work is ongoing to bring prosecutions against them, he said. We urge the public to contact us immediately should they come across any unauthorised encampments on the borough. One of the founders of We Love Our Highway Facebook group, Daniel Lewis, said one way of resolving the recurrent problem would be to provide travellers with permanent pitches. Obviously it's unfair for the people who pay their taxes to have all this rubbish dumped on the site. But they tend to keep themselves to themselves 
What we would really like to see is if the council could find them a bit of derelict land where they could go just because just moving them on all the time doesn't fix the problem. There's a place called Fern Hill in Harlow where there is a permanent traveller's site that's run by the council. We need something like that here because whoever you are and wherever you're from, you need a place to call home, she added. North Middlesex University Hospital will welcome its newly appointed chairman next week. Dusty Unruliwala, former non-executive director of Barking, Havering and Redbridge University NHS Hospital Trust, has 25 years' experience in the Royal Air Force and he is replacing John Carrier. After the hospital in Stirlingway, Edmonton came under fire last year for a troubled A&E department, Mr Amroliwala will now be drawing up a blueprint to secure North Middlesex's financial future and clinical services. We are delighted Dusty is joining us as chair of the board, said Libby McManus, North Middlesex University Hospital NHS Trust Chief Executive. We look forward to working together to continue to improve the services we provide for our patients, the local community we serve and the hard-working staff who work and train here. Mr Amroli Waller is also the Deputy Vice-Chancellor and Chief Operating Officer of the University of East London and also the Chairman of the Trustees of London Design and Engineering College. He is also a trustee of Combat Stress and a lay member of the Judicial Conduct Investigations Office. Steve Russell, NHS Improvements Executive Regional Manager, uh, said that Mr Amroli Waller's strong leadership skills were crucial to improving the trust at a pace required over the coming year. Our trust faces a number of challenges and Dusty's appointment is a key element of the support that NHS Improvement is providing to the organisation, he added. New rules for disabled parking bays have been introduced to meet the shortage of spaces in the borough. Residents with mobility issues can now apply and buy a designated parking bay near their home from Enfield Council. The regulations have been changed after residents with disabilities raised concerns that there were insufficient designated parking bays. Many were left with the inconvenience of parking down the street from their homes because spaces were often occupied. Residents must qualify for the Blue Badge Disability Permit to use the parking spaces. Existing disabled parking bays will remain accessible to blue badge holders. Since the revised provisions were launched last month, six residents have applied for the designated bays. Daniel Anderson, the council's cabinet member for environment, said... Having listened to the concerns of drivers with mobility issues, we have addressed this problem and have responded actively to make parking fairer and accessible to those who need it most. The change should enable many disabled people to continue to lead independent lives without having to worry about not being able to park close to their homes. Residents concerned about the misuse of Blue Badge can log a report anonymously via the Council's website at www.enfield.gov.uk. Those found misusing the badge could be prosecuted or fined up to £1,000. To apply for a disabled person's parking permit, or for more information about mobility in Enfield, get in touch with the council by visiting www.enfield.gov.uk. An Enfield man has been arrested in connection with a prolonged sexual attack of a woman on a busy train during the morning rush hour. The 23-year-old victim was sexually assaulted after boarding a packed Greater Anglia train at Enfield Lock at about 8am Monday, January the 30th. Details of the indecent assault were only released on Monday by British Transport Police, who are appealing to find a vital witness. 
The victim was touched inappropriately on her back and bottom by a man during the journey. Noticing the woman in distress, a male passenger intervened and blocked the attacker by standing in front of him. The victim was then escorted off the train by the passenger at Stratford Station, and police are now appealing for him to get in touch. A 33-year-old man was arrested on suspicion of sexual assault and has been released on bail until Wednesday, March the 8th. Investigating Officer Detective Constable Suleiman Yazdani said this was a prolonged assault on board a very busy train which has understandably upset the victim. No one should ever be subjected to unwanted sexual contact. We're pleased she had the confidence to report it. I am very keen to speak with the man who intervened during this assault by standing in between the victim and her attacker. Please get in touch as soon as possible, as you may have vital information that could help us investigate. Anyone with information is asked to contact police by texting 61016 or by calling 0800 40 50 40 and quoting reference 114 of 30th of January 2017. The refusal of dustmen to empty the recycling bin of the wife of one of Enfield's Conservative councillors has led to a dust-up. Marcia Chamberlain, the wife of Bushill Park Ward councillor Lee Chamberlain, says she was bemused and confused when Binman told her they couldn't take it as it contained a plastic carrier bag, which is not permitted. She said that that surprised her as a council leaflet she possessed and which she was dutifully complying to, clearly showed carrier bags were household items that could be recycled, and if that had now changed, nobody had bothered to tell her. Like most people, I carefully sort my rubbish for collection, and have been recycling plastic carrier bags right up until the incident without any complaint from the dustman, she said. A sticker they attached to the bin's lid showing banned items now included carrier bags, but I hadn't been aware of that because neither I nor any other householder in my street was notified or sent an updated leaflet or letter in the post. Surely, if the council is going to make changes, it should inform residents first, she added. It is this slapdash approach that is really annoying. Enfield Council, however, insisted that all households across the borough had been made aware of the new recycling regulations which came into effect in September last year. Daniel Anderson, the council's cabinet member for the environment, said that new leaflets and bin lid stickers detailing the updated rules had been sent to residents across the borough and that the new rules banning plastic bags, or tied-up bags, had featured in an article in the council's R. Enfield magazine last September. He added that the council had had advertised the new rules in local newspapers this month and last month, and emailed councillors about the changes. Mrs Chamberlain said that she had not received the leaflet, otherwise she would have replaced the old one stuck to her fridge and claimed she hadn't seen the adverts, suggesting a better way to inform residents would be to notify them by post. Leo Field was in terrible pain when he first laid eyes on his bride-to-be, Sheila. He had toothache and nipped into a dental clinic in Palmer's Green to see if they could help. That's where he met the love of his life, who was working as a dental nurse, a job she kept for 40 years. Sheila and Leo were married on February the 23rd in 1957 at Our Lady of Dolores Catholic Church in Hendon before going on honeymoon to Jersey. The couple of Buckingham Close, Enfield, attribute their 60 years together to love and laughter and the odd bit of selective hearing. Sheila, 85, said, It's all about love and laughter, you've got to have those things, and a strong faith in the church. After national service, Leo did a stint washing cars at his brother's sales showroom next to the dentist where Sheila worked and then landed his dream job as a radio broadcaster with the BBC. 
The couple are committed churchgoers and active members of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and St George in London Road, Enfield. Sheila is in the ladies' group. And in their spare time, Leo plays golf and Sheila has just retired from a 30-year stint working as a volunteer in the Oxfam shop in Enfield Town. They will be celebrating their diamond wedding anniversary with a family meal and they had a big family celebration surrounded by loved ones on Sunday at West Lodge Park Hotel in Hadley Wood. Leo81 said, It doesn't seem like any time ago since we met. It's just like yesterday. Time goes by. You've got to do what you know. And it keeps laughing, he said. The couple have two children, Louise, 52, and Mark, 49, and they also have two grandchildren, Alice, age 26, and Sophie, who's 23. Pupils have been praised after their school won an outstanding rating from inspectors. Youngsters at St Anne's Catholic High School for Girls in Oakthorpe Road, Palmer's Green, have benefited from inspirational leadership and the academic achievement of its pupils after being rated outstanding, says Ofsted. The school was given the Education Watchdog's highest rating in the majority of categories. St Anne's head, Siobhan Gillings, said she was delighted by the outcome of the two-day inspection in December last year. She said, we are exceptionally proud. Ofsted have endorsed the hard work and outstanding teaching, learning and pastoral support that is at the heart of our school and have confirmed that achievement, behaviour and leadership are all excellent. Inspectors noted that pupils were happy, confident and safe, and had excellent academic skills. Staff morale was very high, the quality of teaching was outstanding, and behaviour was impeccable, they added. Afer Orhan, Enfield Council's Cabinet Member for Education, Children's Services and Protection said, St Anne's School has earned this well-deserved success and it is always great news to hear of a school success. A father left paralysed after crashing his car the day before his son was born has thanked the emergency services for saving his life. Adam Gardner of Ballsmore Way, Enfield, nearly died after the crash in East Side Road the day before his son Archie was born. The 27-year-old now wants to praise the London Ambulance Service and the Air Ambulance, who saved his life. The crash, in June 2013, left him paralysed from the waist down, thanks to severe neck and back injuries, and in a wheelchair for life. He also credits his son, now a thriving three-year-old, for giving him the motivation to recover. He said, I have to accept the changes physically, but I am now a much better human being. When the carers help come over, he says, Daddy, Daddy, let me help. Having my son has completely changed my whole life for the better. Without my son, I may not have been able to accept the changes. My son will grow up knowing me like this. Having him in my life, being born the following day, really puts things into perspective. He is my rock. It's unbelievable how advanced he is for his age, possibly because I am the way I am. When paramedics were called to the crash, he was not breathing, but the advanced trauma team managed to resuscitate him. Adam needs full-time care, but has recovered some feeling in his fingers and hands due to the prompt care he received at the time. I am in a wheelchair for life, but in terms of how bad the road accident was, I could not be in a better way. If it were not for the London Air Ambulance, I would not have made it. The care they provide with a doctor cannot be done by an ambulance crew. The London Air Ambulance is a charity which costs £8.5 million a year to run and is funded entirely by donations. 
Mr Gardner says at the time of the accident, the service were able to get to him as they were at the start of their shift. Earlier this month, Adam was able to show his thanks to the charity by presenting them with a cheque of £650 raised by Beale's Hotels at West Lodge Park. His aunt, Lynn Marsh-Jones, who works at the hotel, suggested supporting the charity in honour of her nephew. The fish finger of fame was pointing at Enfield resident Gabrielle Sander last week after she was crowned champion sandwich maker in a national competition. The 33-year-old was presented with a glittering gold-encrusted trophy in the shape of a sandwich by Master Chef Judge Greg Wallace at an awards bash at an East London restaurant on Thursday night after a cook-off against two other finalists. Organised by frozen food giant Birdseye, the competition involved both members of the public as well as a separate contest for professional chefs. It was aimed at finding the most innovative and attention-grabbing culinary sandwich creations using the tasty tea time favourite and Gabriella's recipe of fish fingers with mayo, smoked paprika, capers, lime juice, wasabi and rocket in a farmhouse bap clinched it for her. The media worker who lives in Canterbury Road is a big fish finger eater and decided to enter the competition after spotting it in Supermarket Waitrose's magazine. I've been making my fish finger sandwiches for family and friends for years, she said. It is my go-to food, my comfort food. Gabrielle won't have to shop for fish fingers for a while as part of her prize is a year's supply and her photo and recipe is to appear on bird's eye packs of fish fingers. Devotees turn detective to track down a fascinating insight in the so-called Crocus King who created one of London's most beautiful parks in Enfield. Horticulturists have uncovered a treasure trove of information about Edward Augustus Bowles, the mastermind behind the marvellous Middleton House Gardens at Bowles Cross. His lifelong work with plants at Middleton House has been detailed and is now available for researchers to delve into a Royal Horticulturals, Horticultural Sochi's Lindley Library in Central in central London. Bowles was one of Britain's most well-known self-taught gardeners, artists and expert botanists and made the gardens famous through his work. He died in 1954, aged 89, leaving a glorious legacy of his work. The papers give an account of the development of the gardens and to his lifelong dedication to flora and fauna. This is very exciting news, said James Hall, head gardener at Middleton House. This has been achievable party due to the years of efforts on the part of Bow Society, members volunteering into, into catalogue boxes and boxes of papers, letters and documents that came from Middleton House after his death. We already continue to keep his legacy alive in the gardens by aiming to grow many of the rare and unusual plants that Bowles himself cultivated in his day. And this archive provides an invaluable resource for research, shedding new light on his life's work. The archives include paintings, journals and photographs relating to his plant hunting trips and six decades of correspondence with eminent fellow botanists. Middleton House's eight acres of gardens have been restored in bowel style and are also home to a museum, a carp lake, a Victorian conservatory and a number of historical artefacts including pieces from the original St Paul's Cathedral. The archive can be found at www.rhs.org.uk Campaigners say losing £1.3 million from the health budget does not take into account the ageing population. 
Enfield Council has been forced to knock £436,000 from the public health budget. This is because the amount of money it gets from central government will decrease and by 2021 it will lose £1.3 million. But campaigners say the population increase over the last 15 years, as well as the cost of looking after more elderly people with disabilities, has been ignored. There are increased pressures on the demand for social services, both by adults and children. Meanwhile, helping overweight people across all ages costs the borough £84 million a year. Glenn Stewart, Enfield's Assistant Director of Public Health, said, We will be working to make these cuts as efficiently as possible. But, at a time of increasing concern at the pressure facing health and social care services, this may be seen as a false economy. The call to arms is to improve lifestyles so people can live as fully as possible. Unfortunately, this may be made more difficult as cuts are made to the public health budget. Meanwhile, a campaign to tackle the way Enfield is given less cash than other boroughs has been launched by the Over 50s Forum. Enfield Council gets £496.10 per head in government cash, while Westminster gets £917.59 and Hammersmith and Fulham receives £900 per head. To sign the Fairer Funding for Enfield petition, go to www.change.org slash p for peter slash enfield borough hyphen over hyphen five o s hyphen fairer hyphen funding hyphen for hyphen enfield or more easily you can sign on at most libraries enfield town completed a league double over worthing winning three one at Woodside Road. The first action of the afternoon came when Worthing's debutant keeper, Kieran Thorpe, made a fine reflex save in the ninth minute. John Muleba charged down the right and crossed low for Mickey Parcell, whose first-time effort was brilliantly turned behind by the former Eastbourne borough man. Chances came from both sides, but it was not until the half-hour mark when Enfield Town took the lead. Scott Shulton picked the ball up in a central position and advanced past Brannan O'Neill before unleashing an arrow of a shot that found the back of the net via the post. Enfield should have made it 2-0 just before the break when Carl Oliyide pulled the ball back for Bobby Devine, but he couldn't quite make sufficient contact. The Rebels' Lewis Clark almost gained the equaliser when he got behind Harold Joseph and hit a low cross, but Nathan MacDonald was equal to it. Town doubled their lead immediately after the restart, when Tyler Campbell skipped down the left and his cross fell to Billy Crook to side foot home. Enfield scored their third in the 58th minute when Oliyide was on hand to turn in a crook free kick to effectively seal the points. Worthing gained their consolation goal when Lloyd Dawes headed home from an Aaron Hopkinson free kick. As the game continued, Town had more chances to add to their goal tally, but failed to do so, with Tyler Campbell firing over a crook pass and an Oliyide shot safely gathered by Thorpe. Devine had a good run, which ended with him shooting narrowly wide before Parcel looked to have been upended in the home box, but the referee booked him for simulation, as the Towners took all three points. 
Enfield star boxer Frank Bullioni has signed a promotional deal with Matchroom Boxing. He will defend his British light heavyweight title against Ricky Summers at the O2 in London on Saturday, March the 4th. Bullioni saw off Hosea Burton to win the crown in an epic clash in Manchester last December when he stopped the local favourite in the last round. Wise Guy wants the Lonsdale belt as he prepares for his first fight with new promoter Eddie Hearn. Bullioni said, I wanted to get the British title and prove to myself and the fans that I was championship material and could put on a performance. I was very impressed with the whole setup for the Burton fight with Sky Sports. The build-up was great, and as soon as the offer came from Eddie, I jumped at it, as Matcham and Sky Sports are putting on great shows all year round. This is the platform to be on. He added, I've worked hard to get the British title, and I want to win it outright. I don't think that it's been done for over 25 years in my division, so I really want to achieve it. I'm looking to get this one out of the way and look for two more defences to make that happen. There's no such thing as an easy title defence as anyone that fights for it is going to give it everything they've got. And firefighters race to an old folks flats in Enfield after the block's automatic alarm was triggered by fish cakes a resident was frying for her lunch. Three fire engines from Southgate Edmonton and Enfield attended Albeha Court, a block of 47 sheltered flats in Albeha Close, on Friday afternoon. Smoke from the woman's kitchen set off the sheltered flats fire alarm, but fortunately there was no emergency, but it's the brigade's job to respond it especially when it comes from such an establishment, said Daniel Alley, the station manager at Southgate Fire Station. Hello again. As you know, we love hearing from our listeners and uh, our chairman, Philip, received a a letter this week from one of our listeners, uh, Lisa Hermans, and it's amazing because Lisa happens to be my next-door neighbour. So I'm really surprised at seeing this. Dear Talking Newspaper, I am writing to say how much I enjoyed the Christmas edition with all the extra poems and stories. I enjoy listening to all the different readers' voices. They are very clear and make the news interesting. I love listening to music and look forward to hearing the new intro music. My idea for the new music is that it should be quirky, and maybe have something of a 40s style to it. I really appreciate all the time you volunteers give to producing such an excellent talking newspaper. Well, thank you very much, Lisa. We all appreciate your letter. One more thing that we should mention. Uh, This week saw the 70th birthday of uh, our good friend and Diane's husband, Keith de Jersey, 70th birthday. He looks no more than 70. (laughs) Actually, he looks a lot younger. We've reached the end of our programme for this week. Thank you for listening. So, from the team of Sonia, Jenny, Roz, Alan and Dorothy, who at the age of 10 has become Enfield Talking Newspaper's youngest ever reader... And with Ian on the controls, it's... Goodbye. goodbye. Say goodbye. 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 <laughs> Please remember to turn over the address label in your postal packet, put the memory stick into the packet, and return it to us as soon as possible, in readiness for the next edition. Don't forget, you can call Diane de Jersey regarding any help you may require in connection with Enfield Talking Newspaper on 020-8805-6578. Coming up next, the latest news and information for the Greater London area from InfoSound. The Enfield Talking newspaper will be with you again in one week's time. <laughs>